Look at guys like Jose. Look at St. Maria Gretti, who we talked about a few weeks ago. And that's why I love talking to you guys about saints who were your age, because I know that holiness is possible. That, And I've seen a lot of great things going on with this group of students, my students over at St. Andrews. I see some real positive things and some real signs of holiness in some of you guys. I'm really impressed by that. And so it gives me great hope when I get to talk to you guys about saints who exhibited that faith and so that you can take things from their lives. and consider God's presence with us here tonight. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to you for you letting us live in a place where we don't have to worry about practicing our faith and being in any danger by doing so. We ask that you send St. Jose here tonight to help tell his story about living in a time when it wasn't safe to practice your faith and how he dealt with that. Help him convey his courage and his resolve at dealing with his situation. We ask that you give us safe passage home tonight and we thank you for the meal that we had earlier. Thank you for, for providing for us. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son. Spirit. Amen. I want to read a couple scripture passages real quick that I think kind of are a good lead in to talk about tonight's saint. This is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 22. It says this Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves but beware of people for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues and you will be led before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them and the pagans when they hand you over do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say you will be given at that moment what you are to say for i will not excuse me for it will not be you who speak but this <clears throat> but the spirit of your father speaking through you Brother will hand over brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. There's also a short reading from 1 Timothy, and in your workbooks, there's a little write-up on St. Jose. <clears throat> it quotes a scripture verse, and there's a typo in there. It says 2 Timothy, but it's 1 Timothy, and it says this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one have contempt for your youth, but set an example for those who believe in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And so I start with those because I think both of those exemplify St. Jose Sanchez del Rio, who we're talking about tonight. Some of you may have heard of him. He lived about 100 years ago or so um, in Mexico. And I don't know how much Mexican history you guys actually get in your history lessons. I mean, there's probably the times where it talks about the Mexican territory, which is part of the United States. Maybe the, the uh, Texan-Mexico Texan War, stuff like that. But there's a part of Mexican history that isn't told much because, honestly, some governments don't want it known what actually happened. Um, and so it all starts back in, like, the mid-1800s when, in Mexico, some um, some people who are Freemasons, and I don't know if you know who the Freemasons are, but anyway, it's a group that is looking for the destruction of the Catholic Church. That's the easiest way to put it. And they started infiltrating the Mexican government. <clears throat> and they started, you know, started writing some laws into things that, 
that uh, they could potentially use later. The thing is, is at this time, and even up until the 19 teens, Mexico was like 98% Catholic. And so the fact that these Masons were coming in and they were infiltrating was pretty spectacular. People, you know, they don't think they thought that they would do what they would do. But by 1917, they had written something into the Mexican Constitution. Somehow it got in there because usually this stuff has to be ratified. <clears throat> it got in there that basically says the government has the power to make decisions for the church, including, um, you know, whether the church can exist or not. And so this is all kind of sets the stage for things. So that's, so this is the time in which Jose lived. Jose was born in 1913. He was born in a town called Suajo, which is about 300 miles west of Mexico City. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a fairly good sized town, but it's not like a major city. And um, again, this, the population there was at least 98% Catholic. And so he was raised Catholic. They went to church. They, the church was the center of, of their activities. But he was like any other kid. Um, there's a movie that came out in about 2012 called For Greater Glory. And there's a character in there who's very closely patterned after St. Jose. I can't remember if they actually call him that in the movie or not. And a couple of the details are a little bit iffy, but, um, but basically it's him. And in there it shows that, like I said, he's just a regular kid. It shows him and a buddy of his playing a prank on the parish priest. And so they're just, you know, they're kind of having their laugh and the priest kind of calls them out. But the priest then actually welcomes them in and they start, you know, helping him with masses and doing different things like that. And so he becomes friends with the parish priest. And, you know, unbeknownst to him, you know, this all this stuff in the government is kind of going on behind the scenes. So in 1924, Jose is about 11 years old, a guy named Plutarco Elias Caius becomes the president of Mexico. And to say that this guy was a bad guy is an understatement. Um, he, he was, some people said he was just a monster. <clears throat> he was an atheist. He was a, free, a 33rd degree Freemason, which is the highest level. Um, and just, just a bad guy. And so he, I think they actually said that this constitutional amendment in 1917, they called it Caius's Law. So I don't know if he was in, if he helped institute it or if he just implemented it in 1924. But he started getting things in place and um, and, and started kind of planning his takeover. In 1926, he fully implemented this plan and he went in in one fell swoop. They shut the churches down. They closed all the convents, all the seminaries. They confiscated all church property in the country of Mexico. And they didn't just walk in and say, okay, it's ours. They walked in with their guns and the rifles. The army comes in and they literally would just take priests out of the church and they would say, you know, um, apostatize your faith. It, meaning basically say, you know, I, I um, say that my faith isn't real. <clears throat> and the priests would say no and they would just shoot them or they would hang them or they would do whatever. I mean, they weren't gonna put up with anything. And so they just had this reign of terror that just went through. And this is shown really well in this movie, For Greater Glory. I would highly recommend you see it. Um, it's, it's, it's not a fun movie to watch, but it really gives you an idea of, of how people's faith can help them get through this situation. And so there's actually a scene in the movie, and whether it's true or not, but they, there's a scene in the movie where Jose runs and he warns the parish priest. The parish priest um, is like, you know, I know they're coming and, and I'm too old to have this fight. And basically they, they kill his parish priest before his eyes. And so he's about, let's see, this is in 1926 when this happens. He's about 13 years old. And he goes and he tells his mom, he says, you know, we've got to do something about this. <clears throat> and at this time, the government, um, it, like I said, is cracking down on people. Well, the people are trying to petition the government. They're, they're having peaceful rallies. They're, they're trying to go through and say, you don't have the right to do this. And during their protests, basically the government would come in and just start shooting, just start mowing people down. And it was just a really ugly situation. And so they realized, okay, this isn't gonna be settled peacefully. And again, they're mostly Catholic, but they went through all the right channels, but they're like, we have to defend ourselves because if we don't defend ourselves and our families, our whole way of life is going to be gone. We aren't going to be able to practice our faith at all. 
And so they started taking up arms. Um, the, it started off with these kind of, just these bands of people would just kind of organize, they'd be out in the country. And they were called um, the Cristeros. But they were, they were just not well organized. Different bands would organize and they would try and do things and they had limited success in trying to rebel against the government. So again, in this movie, For Greater Glory, there's a scene in there where basically some of the, the rich people in town decided, okay, we've got we've to do something. And so they go out and they hire a former Mexican general. And they basically said, we have a job for you. We need you to organize this so that we can, we can pull off this rebellion against the government. And he's like, what are you kidding? I mean, you've got nothing. You've got a bunch of untrained people. You've got no weapons. You've got no nothing. But he says, I like a challenge. We're going to do it. And so they pay him some money to start organizing these Cristeros. And he does. And he was nominally Catholic, but he, uh, he, he saw that, that they were unified in this cause. And so he says, this, this is something that we can use to our advantage. And so after a time, the Cristeros actually start winning. And they are doing things like they are you know, robbing trains and you know, they're, they're blowing up um, government installations and they're getting their they're stealing the, the weapons, and some of the people in town are, especially the wives, they're able to smuggle the, the weapons out to the Cristeros, and they're really, they're succeeding. And so, at this time, uh, Jose's two older brothers, they go off and join the Cristeros. And Jose is about 14 at the time, and he's like, I want to join too, and his mom's like, you're too young. And so, you know, he just, he kind of bided his time. Well, there was a government official who was a very strong Catholic and he was assassinated. And Jose goes and visits his grave and he's very inspired by this man. And he says, he decides, he says, this is something I need to do. I need to be in this fight, even if it means my martyrdom. He says, I need to fight for Jesus Christ. And so he goes back to his mom and his mom finally relents and says, okay, fine, just go join the Cristeros. Um, you have my blessing. So he and a buddy of his, they go up into the mountains and they try and find some of these bands of the Cristeros. And they find the first one and the first one goes, you're just a kid, you know, forget it. You know, we don't, we, you can't help us. So they keep looking. Eventually they travel about 40 miles and they find the unit that this general is a part of. And he's like, you're 14, you know, what are you gonna do? And, and Jose just, he just convinces them and the general saw something in him that he knew that this kid was the real deal. And he said, okay, well, you're too young for me to make you a warrior, but I'm going to make you our flag bearer. And he's like, great, you know, anything I can do to help. And that might seem like a menial job, but think about it. In, in those times, the flag bearer was somebody that they would kind of rally the troops. Um, he, he may or may not have had a weapon. I don't know. <clears throat> but they were, they were very instrumental in helping keep the troops organized. And so the Cristeros were winning, but it wasn't just that they were um, armed as best they could because they weren't. They were outgunned. They were, the, the government still had tons more ammunition. They had tons more troops. But the Cristeros had one advantage that the government didn't have, is that they had their Catholic faith. And so one of the things that was actually required was that they had to go to Mass. All of the Cristeros had to go to Mass. And they had priests in their ranks, so they were having Masses outside. They also had to pray the rosary as part with the group. And these were required. They could be disciplined if they didn't do this, this stuff. If they were using bad language, if they didn't go to confession, they, they were being disciplined. And so their leaders realized that we might be outnumbered and we might be outgunned, but we have something the other group doesn't have. We have Jesus Christ to lead us. So if we can remain faithful to him, we can win. And this has been proven through history. This has happened a number of times where groups have been, you know, outnumbered and, and totally out, out, uh, out everything. And they've won because they've kept their faith in Christ and the Lord has fought for these people. And so, like I said, they start winning. After Jose joins the unit, they can see that this was the right decision because he's just a true witness to the faith and the older guys are inspired by this 14-year-old kid about what he's doing. In fact, they nicknamed him Tarsisius. Um, Tarsisius was a martyr, a uh, teenager, who was martyred in ancient Rome. He was running the Eucharist between the underground churches and the catacombs. And, he, and somebody um, 
they captured him, realized he's carrying the Eucharist, and they beat him to death for it. Okay. So they nicknamed Jose Tarsicius because they saw that desire, that love of Jesus in him. And so um, as time progresses, you know, the Cristeros are starting to win. They're starting to, to make headway. In fact, I was, looked it up before coming in here. The death toll of the Cristeros to the Federales, there was twice as many Federales that were killed in the Cristero War as the Cristeros, although a lot of Cristeros died. Um, a lot of them were, were put to death. And their battle cry was, Viva Cristo Rey, meaning long live Christ the King. And so they would be yelling this going into battle. And they knew that at the beginning, that even though they were outgunned, they were outmanned, they were, the technology that the Federalites had was far superior to theirs, they had God on their side. And they realized if we stay faithful to Christ, he's going to be fighting with us. So in late January of 1928, um, there's a, a battle that they're in, and it's a particularly violent one. And um, the, I think it was the general, um, his horse was shot. So again, even though it's the late 1920s, all they have for technology to fight with is like they're riding on horseback, okay, is what they're doing. This is rural Mexico in the late 1920s. Well, the, this general's horse gets shot, and Jose sees this, and he's like, you know, I know that they need the general more than they need the flag bearer. He gives his horse to the general. And the general's like, you know, we'll, you know, we'll try and get you out of here. And they try and fight him off. Well, eventually they have to retreat. And there's a, few, there's a bunch of other uh, troops that are left. And they're just trying to fight as much as they possibly can. But eventually the Federales come in and they, they uh, capture Jose and a number of other people. And so um, they're almost kind of like, now they're sending kids against us, right? But they didn't realize kind of the fervor with which Jose lived his life and lived his faith. And so they take him to um, the close, closest town and they put him in prison, which was a church. Um, and shortly thereafter, they transferred him back to Sawaiho, which is where he was from, and they put him in the prison there, which was also the church. And it happened to be the church that he was baptized at. And so it was really, so he, he really felt at home there, and, but he really felt you know, comforted that, that this had happened to him this way. And so back in Soaiho, there was a gentleman named Rafael uh, Picasso, and he was the mayor of the town. And Picasso also happened to be Jose's godfather. So everybody thought, okay, well, Jose's been captured. You know, we'll talk. It's his godfather. His godfather's not going to hurt him. Um, and, his, and Jose's dad was trying to come up with a ransom for Jose, you know, so he could buy him out of prison. Well, this Picasso guy was, he was not a good guy. In fact, he had like this gang of thugs and they would go around and they'd rough up people in town. And, and um, there was one time when some, uh, somebody recognized him and pointed him out and he didn't like that, so he had him killed. So this Picasso was not a good guy. He, had, he was Catholic, but he had totally sold out to the government. He had totally sold out to this whole idea of secularism. And, um, and, and just was not, he, he was not the leader that they needed at the time. He was not the people everybody thought he was. But he also knew that he needed to save face, and he couldn't do anything to Jose because he knew if he did, the people would revolt because they knew that he was Jose's godfather. So he's like, okay, well, you know, I, I got to save face here, but we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So what he does is he takes another prisoner named Lorenzo and Jose out, and they're going to torture Lorenzo, and they're going to kill him. And they're going to show Jose this and say, okay, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't say death to Christ the King. So they take, they take him out, and they start torturing Lorenzo, they, they, they threaten to hang him, and Jose just encourages Lorenzo. He goes, you know, just, it'll be fine, you know. You know I'll be with you in heaven soon. You know, just have courage and stay, you know, stay at the course. Viva Cristo Rey. And so they wind up hanging Lorenzo. And they, they say, you know, all you have to do is say, death to Christ the King, and you can live. And Jose just looks him dead in the eye and he says, Viva Cristo Rey. So they, they pull Lorenzo down. They take him to the cemetery, and um, um, they, then they drop him off there, and then they start heading back to town. Well, one story said that Lorenzo actually didn't die by hanging. 
he was only unconscious. And after the federales left, the um, cemetery worker realized that he wasn't dead and said, hey, I'll just take care of this. And he gets up and he leaves and he goes back to the Cristeros. Um, I don't know if that's a legend, I don't know if that's true, but it would be pretty cool if it was the case. Um, so anyway, so they take Jose back to the prison and outside of where Jose was being held was the sanctuary of the church. And in the sanctuary of the church, they were keeping the roosters that they were using for the rooster fights. And so these roosters belonged to his godfather, Rafael Picasso. And so Jose was really upset about this. He says, you know, you're desecrating this church. This is a church, not a barn. And so he asked permission to go to the bathroom. He went out and he killed the roosters because he said, this is just, this is, this is past the line. You've, you've crossed the line. So they found out that Jose had done this, and that was the last straw with Picasso. Picasso said, we're going to kill him. So they knew that they couldn't just take him out and do this. So what they were going to do is they said, under the cover of darkness tonight, we're going to take him out and we're going to, we're going to torture him and then we're going to kill him. So what they did is they took him to this one place where they did tortures and they held him down. And one of the common tortures of the time is that they would hold you down and they would shave the bottoms of your feet off with a machete or with sharp object. And so that they would cut all of the thick skin off the bottom of your feet. I know, it's gross, it's, but this is what they would do. And it really made me think, it's like, if, if their case was so strong, how come you have to enforce it with violence, right? If, if you've got this great idea and everybody should buy into it, don't you think you could have a discussion and say, my idea is better than yours and we should do it this way? But the problem is when someone has such a weak position as theirs was, the only way they can enforce it is through violence. And so when, when, that's, when, that, when you see that stuff happening, you know the other person's wrong, not just because they're doing violence, but they can't even sit down and have a discussion about it. And so they torture Jose, who's a 14-year-old kid, and they're shaving the bottoms of his feet off, which you can imagine would be quite painful. And they said, all you got to do is say, death to Christ the King, and we'll let you go. He's like, viva Cristo Rey. He says, I'm not going to apostasy on my faith. And they're like, all right. So they get him up and they make him walk through town. Again, this is under the cover of darkness. And these aren't nice roads like we've got. He's walking on gravel roads with the bottoms of his feet cut off. And he's, you know, he's just kind of, they're making him do it. And they're sitting behind him with bayonets and they're poking him and they're stabbing him and doing all this kind of stuff. And they're making him go along. And he's praying the rosary while he's going. He's just like, and he's, he's praying for his torturers. I mean, he was really taking a, a page out of Christ's playbook. Is that on his death march, he was praying for those who were persecuting him. He was praying the rosary. He was asking for Mary's help, who he had a great devotion to. And so they walk him through town towards the cemetery. And they get to the cemetery and they go, basically, that's your grave right there. All you have to do is say, death to Christ the King. And he looks him square in the eye and he goes, viva Cristo Rey. And there's a couple of stories that, are, that um, differ on exactly what happened next. Some say somebody stabbed him. Some say somebody shot him. Um, some say that they actually hung him up and were swinging him around and poking him with bayonets, things like that. Um, different sources I had said different things. But basically, somebody either shot or stabbed him. As he fell to the ground, he, with his blood, made the sign of the cross on the ground and kissed it. And then they shot him and killed him and kicked him into the grave. And some of the townspeople had seen what was going on and they, they spread word about what had happened to Jose. And so, um, you know, you say, people say to me all the time, Steve, you know, these are teenagers. You can't expect anything out of them. You know, they're just going to be messing around doing stuff. And I'm like, look at guys like Jose. Look at St. Maria Gretti, who we talked about a few weeks ago. That's why I love talking to you guys about saints who were your age because I know that holiness is possible. That, and I've seen a lot of great things going on with this group of students, my students over at St. Andrews. I see some real positive things and some real signs of holiness in some of you guys. I'm really impressed by that. And so it gives me great hope when I get to talk to you guys about saints who exhibited that faith and so that you can take things from their lives I mean, please, God, that we don't have to go through the things that 
Jose went through. So, 14 year old um, kid, this is what they do. I mean, you would think that if your case was this good that your way of life is better, don't you think you could have a discussion and convince somebody without torture and murder and all this kind of stuff? So that usually when people have to resort to that, it means that they're wrong and it means they're operating from a position of weakness and that the only thing they have to convince you is fear. Okay, so when governments start implementing fear, that's a, that's a bad sign and we need to fight against that. And so, um, the, Mex the uh, Cristero War ends in about 1929, a little over a year after that. The, the, a truce ensues because basically the Mexican government says, we're going to lose this thing. And so they call the truce, and so all the Cristeros lay down their arms. The government goes out, rounds up all the Cristeros, and executes them. So you can tell the level, level of honor that this government had. It was zero. Okay, but the war still ends. And, um, you know, but conditions start to get a little bit better in Mexico, um, but it's, it's still, it wasn't great for a lot of years. In fact, in the 80s and 90s, priests couldn't still, could not wear their clerics in public in the 1980s and 1990s in Mexico. Right after he was elected Pope, um, in 19, he was elected Pope in 1978, in January of 1979, Pope John Paul II said, I want to go to Mexico. It was his first international trip. They're like, we don't even know if they're going to let you in. You know, he says, well, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to Our Lady Guadalupe, which is in Mexico City, and um, we'll call it that. And so he goes, and three million people meet him at the airport. And so it's, it, it was amazing that he was even able to get in, but it's this huge Catholic surge at that point in time. And over the course of the next 10 years or so, things got a lot better for the Catholics. Still not great. It's still a Masonically controlled government there. Um, but at least the Catholics can practice their faith. During the Cristero War, to give you an example, before the war, there was over 5,000 priests in Mexico. By the end of the war, there was 300. The rest had either been exiled or most of them had been killed. And so this was just, just an ugly, ugly chapter in Mexican history. But what I want to leave you with is this idea that because their faith was strong, even when they had to... <clears throat> Even when they had to resort to fighting with guns, they trusted that Jesus was going to deliver them. And so they just, this constant cry of Viva Cristo Rey is what won that war for the Cristeros. Uh, Jose was uh, beatified in November of 2005, right after Pope Benedict had come in to be Pope. And Pope Francis canonized him in 2016. So he's only been a saint for like seven years. But he is a very important figure um, in Mexican history. There's a lot of Mexicans that really, um, he's one of the heroes, along with uh, Blessed Miguel Pro, a couple other heroes of this war that really can um, instill a lot of pride in, in the Mexican people. And so I would encourage you to get to know uh, Jose. Um, he died at age 14. And like I've told you guys dozens of times before, I, I want you to understand Another thing from him is that at his age, he didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm going to be a saint. He had been working on this. And so holiness is possible even at you guys' age. And so be working on that. And just pray like crazy that we don't have to deal with anything like this ever in our time. This has happened, this happens in the world today now um, where people can't practice their faith. It happens, it's happened a lot of times in the last hundred years especially, but it's happened a lot in the last several centuries. Um, and if it can happen in all the places it's happened, like Russia, Germany, Italy, uh, China, it's going on right now. Um, a lot of uh, countries in the Middle East, you can't be Catholic publicly. Um, it can happen anywhere. So it could, could it happen here? Please God, no. But it could. So we need to pray and and thank God that we just live in a place where we can practice our faith. So the carrying of the cross is the mystery and patience and tribulation is the grace. I think you can see why I put Jose in for this because of his, his incredible drive and his incredible patience through all of what happened to him after he was captured by the Federales. And 
you know, he was just determined, you know. And then that, that verse that I read in Matthew's gospel about, you know, I will give you the words, you know. And he just kept saying, Viva Christ El Rey, you know, long live Christ the King. He wasn't going to deny Jesus. And that's, you know, he was doing this in the face of death. So I, I think to myself sometimes, it's like, how come he can, somebody like that can do it in the face of death? And there's times I can't do it in the face of unpopularity or what somebody might think, that type of thing. I mean, what gives someone like Jose the ability to do that? A 14-year-old kid, and I can't do that. And so his example is something I really, I really cherish his example. And when I am put in a situation, I try and call to mind those saints that were able to you know, make that statement of faith when it really mattered. Because anybody can make a statement of faith when it's safe, you know, or you're in a safe situation. We're all here in a church group of church kids and church adults, right? Anybody can do that, you know, but when it gets real hard and, you know, at school, I'm sure most of your schools are not bastions of hope, you know, when it comes to your faith. Um, you know, and I know kids that go to Catholic schools who feel totally alone in their faith. Okay, so it's, it happens everywhere. But those are with jobs, you know. I mean, fortunately, I get to work for the church, and, and I don't have too much problem. But I've worked plenty of secular jobs where I was the only one. And it's hard to listen to people blaspheme, you know, the name of God and to do different things and sit there and just take it. Um, but I never, you know, I could speak up sometimes, and other times I didn't have to speak up. But they, they realized that, you know, hopefully realize that what they were doing is wrong. And so we just need to, we need to just pray for the courage, the fortitude of Jose, and just uh, help bring him into our lives as far as um, what do we do when it gets hard, right? And, you know, there is a time for silence, and there is a time to speak up. Um, and so just pray for the wisdom to know when that time is. Um, something I want to read to you guys in closing. Um, there's a talk on formed, which most of you guys should have a formed account by now. I know that whoever was confirmed has one. Whoever's getting confirmed will have one. There's a guy named Patrick Madrid. He's a pretty famous Catholic apologist. He's got a show on Relevant Radio every morning. But he gives a talk on this. His family... I can't remember if it was his parents or maybe it was his grandparents had to flee Mexico during the Cristero War. And um, so he's like half Mexican, half Spanish, Spain Spanish. Um, and so he gives this talk on this war and it is a really good talk. He gives you a great history of this. So I would highly recommend you do that talk. I'll put the link to this in this video when I post it. Um, but between that and for greater glory, you, you really need to to learn about this time period in history because there are some unfortunate patterns that are developing that says that this type of thing is happening more and more around the world, okay? And so we need to be um, vigilant uh, for this. And so it, there's some really good lessons in there to be learned. But at the end of Patrick's talk, he reads this thing. He says, um, this was written by somebody anonymous, um, and but he says that this, I think, really um, this is what he uses to kind of sum up the Cristero War and, and maybe what our drive needs to be moving forward. It's called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. I am part of the Fellowship of the Unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have stepped over the line. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is in God's hands. I am finished and done with low living, small planning, the bare minimum, smooth knees, mundane talking, frivolous living, selfish giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, applause, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, the best, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on Christ's presence. I love with patience, live by prayer, and labor with the power of God's grace. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. 
and will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, and paid up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I am a Catholic. I must go until he comes, give until I drop, speak out until all I know, and work until he stops me. And when he returns for his own, he will have no difficulty recognizing me. My banner is clear. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed.